trust I'm holding on The substance of your hope and love The substance of your hope and love In your hand I'll face the storms In your will I'm pressing to uh, Matthew chapter 12 as we continue our, our study in, uh, in Matthew's uh, gospel. And um, as you do that, or as you get there, we'll just have a word of prayer. Father, we want to just uh, come before you now and we, Lord, are thankful that we've been able to worship you and our, 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 our singing, our giving, Lord, our fellowship one to another. And certainly now we want to uh, have this time in the word and have it be meaningful to us and so we just pray for your anointing on this time and that you'd give us hearts to hear, Lord, and, uh, and we'd be open to the work of your spirit through the word. In Jesus' name, uh, amen. I, uh, I read about this uh, young guy's science project that I thought was kind of, uh, kind of interesting. Nathan uh, Zoner, 1997, he's, uh, when it took place, he's a 14-year-old, and uh, he, uh, he did a science project uh, on um, the hydrogen monoxide. And uh, did some surveying with people, and this is one of the quotes he used to uh, introduce his subject. He said, "It may cause severe burns, uh, accelerates the corrosion of rusting of many metals, has been found in excised tumors of terminal cancer patients." He said, "Despite this risk, he note this nefarious chemical is often used as an industrial solvent, a coolant in the production of styrofoam, and as a fire retard uh, retardant." And of course, if you know what it is, it's actually the break chem down chemically, you're more familiar with H2O or water. <laughs> uh, the writer of this says that Nathan Zoner's story is a humorous one, but it illustrates an important truth. It's possible for us as human beings to develop a lot of misconceptions, even a dangerous familiarity about something with which we are intimately connected. And as we look at this subject of, of the Shabbat or the Sabbath, there's certainly lots of misconceptions, uh, especially within American Christianity. Uh, and this is the subject of, uh, of, of Matthew 12. Now, keep in mind that the Shabbat, the word or Sabbath means rest. And, and where did we end last week? Jesus uh, given us a promise of rest. So again, Matthew arranges uh, this information topically uh, to, uh, you know, and not chronologically. Uh, Jesus promises us if we come to him and we'll be yoked with him and learn of him, then we will find rest for uh, our souls. And we talked about the, the learning of him involved two things, uh, his meekness and his humility. Again, meekness means the ability to forgive uh, and, uh, and humility. And as we learn from him, we'll find rest for our souls. And then Matthew follows that up with this idea of, uh, of what Jesus will refer to as uh, the fact that he is the Lord of the uh, of the Sabbath. In fact, he uses the word seven times in, in this chapter. Again, just uh, a couple of things of, uh, of what it means uh, because of this idea of, of misconceptions. Uh, in Genesis, God creates the world in six days. On the seventh day, on the Shabbat or seventh day, he rests. That term and that concept is not ever mentioned again until you get to the uh, time of Moses and the what we refer to as the, the Mosaic Law. And then it becomes a, a, a point of, of a command for the people of Israel to rest. It was a, a direct tie with their covenant relationship with Him. Uh, what it does say in the law without reading all of Deuteronomy and uh, Leviticus, it basically says uh, all daily work had to stop. Uh, anyone who desecrates the Sabbath was put to death. Okay, what else does it say? <laughs> that kind of perk your ears right up there if you were part of Israel. I'm going to explain a few rules. By the way, if you miss one, you're dead. You know, it's like, okay, I think I'll study for the test. Uh, all plowing and harvesting had to stop. No fires could be kindled. Under Nehemiah and Jeremiah, uh, there's a fifth concept that's added. No merchants could do work. In other words, you couldn't come in and buy and sell as they were doing during the day of of uh, Nehemiah, they were coming in and conducting business right there in Jerusalem and so forth. And he put a, a ban on that and said that they were not obeying uh, the Sabbath. Uh, in terms of, uh, that's what you couldn't do. Now, what you could do is, 
Uh, the military could carry out their exercises, plans for war. If they're engaged in battle, it doesn't matter if it's the Sabbath or not, man. You just keep uh, defending and pursuing and doing what you're supposed to do. Uh, marriage feasts could be, uh, could be held. Uh, again, I say this because there's this concept, sometimes a misconception, that you can't work on the Sabbath. But uh, if you're in the military, that's work. Uh, if you're putting on a marriage feast, somebody's doing some work somewhere, uh, keeping that thing going and all the food and so forth. A feast of dedication could be held. You could visit a, a man of God or a prophet. Uh, the temple guards could change uh, on the uh, Sabbath. Uh, you could change, the priest would change the showbread in the temple. The duties of the priest would continue. You could open the east gate, which had to be done uh, uh, every morning. And of course, uh, uh, if you'd serve the best food you've got on the, on the sap. Now in Israel today, uh, if you're there, uh, it's uh, again, it begins Friday night. And one of the things that, uh, uh, that happens is that, uh, I don't know if every guy, but about every guy there buys flowers. The girls will like this, buy flowers for their girlfriend, wife, uh, that, that evening. It's like a big tradition. There's like people on the street and flower shops everywhere in Jerusalem on, on late on Friday afternoon. Uh, it's kind of a, it's, it's just a big occasion. That's the idea is to be a, a celebration. Uh, if you eat at home that evening, then it's, it's the best you've got, you know. Uh, if you, uh, if you're going to go out, it's a, a big deal to go to a, a hotel. And again, if you're on a tour, you're staying in a hotel. So you know when it's the, the Shabbat or the Sabbath because there's a big time party going on in the main uh, banquet room and everything. It's meant to be a time of, uh, of celebration because of that. Fasting was seldom ever done on uh, on, a, on a Sabbath because again that's uh, more serious and, and so forth, and um, it's this time of, of celebration. Now, by the time uh, of Jesus uh, setting here in Matthew 12, uh, what's taken place is that the rabbis had developed uh, oral traditions and teachings. Uh, in regards to what it means by not working on the Sabbath. And all it meant was, whatever you normally do for a living, you stop doing that for a living. Uh, and you, you have a day of rest and so forth. But they, they uh, through oral tradition that became recorded and known as the Mishnah later, and then that wasn't enough to tell you how to obey uh, the law of God, then more oral tradition developed explaining the Mishnah, and that becomes the Talmud. So those are a couple of terms you're probably familiar with. Uh, very detailed. Uh, can't work on the Sabbath. That means you can't tie a knot. That means if you have a wooden leg, you can't wear it because that would be bearing a burden. It means you can't lift anything. How heavy? No more than two dried figs. Not kidding. I mean, we're, we're talking exacting, you know, no doubt as far as what it means to not work on the Sabbath. But uh, uh, the point in all of this is that by Jesus' day, they're so caught up and removed from God's intent to what the rabbis and the Pharisees in particular had taught that uh, they really forgot the, the intent of the day and what it was supposed to be uh, all about. Uh, Jesus will have several confrontations with the Pharisees. We've already seen a few of them. Uh, this begins the, the Sabbath day confrontations that he'll have many times because as you can imagine, if you're Jewish, this is a very, this is a very big deal. It's a very big deal, this whole concept of the, the Sabbath day. Uh, in terms of what it was uh, supposed to mean and its original intent, I got uh, three hours from David Hawking to uh, help remember this. It was meant to be a, a day of rest. That's all just a day of rest. And we all need that. We need to, to take a, a, a Sabbath day, a day off, a day of rest. That, that certainly still, uh, I think, uh, applies to, to us. We're not under any law to do that, but certainly uh, uh, we're a lot healthier mentally, physically, and spiritually if we take a, we take a break. Uh, it's meant to de uh, be a day of, of remembrance, and in their case, a day of national remembrance because it had everything to do with the covenant of, between God and, and, uh, uh, and the children of uh, Israel. Uh, they, they remembered uh, God and their covenant relationship, again, under the Mosaic law by taking this day beginning Friday evening till, till Saturday evening, uh, a national day of remembrance. Uh, the third R, a day of rest, national day of remembrance, and then redemption. It was to help them remember that in Egypt they were slaves. And guess what? There was no Sabbath. <laughs> there was no day off. If you're a slave, you work every day. Uh, it was to be a, 
uh, a day of remembrance in terms of redemption and what God had done through them. And for us as well. I mean, that part applies to us. Uh, we were slaves to sin at one time. Uh, and when we meet uh, on uh, a particular day or a particular time to worship God and fellowship, fellowship, it's a day of remembrance as well that we've been set free uh, from our, our sins. Now, what's interesting is that this very Jewish day that has only only to do with with Jewish people and their covenant relationship as Israel with with God in terms of the Mosaic law uh, somehow, again, gets carried over into American Christianity. And I, I would just mention a couple of things about that and why that that took place. The reason it took place is because all of our founding fathers were Puritans. And we, we thank God for that in many respects and so forth. And uh, they were uh, very dedicated to the Lord and, and to the, the Word of God and so forth. And they were fleeing religious persecution, uh, again, in Europe to get here so they could uh, uh, worship the Lord and uh, express their, their love for Him and, and so forth. But, but the Puritans all came from Reformed background. So they, they believe that the church is spiritual Israel. Uh, they even believe that uh, they believed, according to their own writings, and I, I love a lot of these guys quote Matthew Henry to you quite often and so forth. They believe that uh, America in particular was spiritual Israel, uh, that we adopted all these promises uh, again that were applied to the nation of Israel, now applied to uh, to the, the church. Again, which is a, a Roman Catholic idea that got carried over right into the Reformers uh, and on into the Puritans into our own country. That's why when I was a kid growing up, and especially if I were visiting my, uh, my grandparents uh, in the South, uh, it was illegal to open a business on Sunday. Because again, they, they flip it over and begin to call Sunday the Sabbath. Now, Sabbath is... The Shabbat is Friday night till Saturday night, but we kind of Americanize it or Westernize it and flip it over and say that Sunday. How many of you ever heard somebody refer to Sunday as the Sabbath? Well, it may be if you're just an older guy, but this all comes from this concept of the Puritans and this Reformed theology when it comes to their view of Israel and so forth. So when I was a kid, uh, especially visiting uh, in the South, yeah, it was. It was. People just didn't do it out of custom or tradition. It was against the law. It was against the city and county law to work on Sunday or to open a business on Sunday. They were called Sabbath laws. My grandmother did all of her cooking the day before because she couldn't kindle a fire on Sunday. Uh, so it's. Uh, so we. You know. Again, this idea of the Shabbat or the Sabbath. There's. Uh, there's still the uh, Americanized Asian of it where we kind of misunderstand the original intent. What was the original intent? Well, to, t to rest from our normal day's work and uh, labor and so forth. Does that mean that uh, you go to church and then sit in a, a chair all afternoon and <laughs> not do anything? No, it just means you, don't, you take a day off. Uh, and, and that's great. That's what they did from their normal activities. Uh, now, they would uh, meet in synagogue and worship the Lord, which wasn't required by the law, just something that they, uh, they chose to do. Uh, but again, we can have such a misunderstanding of something we're so familiar with. Uh, again, I think it helps to have a, a little background because it continues to be uh, very, very critical to uh, Jews today. I was speaking at a, a Messianic congregation a, a number uh, of a years ago, and, uh, and after the service, they always uh, get together and, and have a meal and so forth. And there was a young gal there who was uh, an immigrant for Russia. Uh, she was Jewish. She had received Jesus as uh, her Hamashiach, the Messiah. She was saved. She was born again and everything. She was telling me that she was so thrilled when she found this Messianic Jewish congregation. Of course, they meet on the Shabbat. They meet on Saturday mornings. And she says it was such a relief to her having been an Orthodox Jew raised in Russia and, uh, and now to know that Jesus is the Messiah. She says, because I just could not worship on Sunday. I just couldn't bring myself to it. She said for a while, she just found a, another Another church, a uh, Christian church that meets on Saturdays, that she didn't agree with her theology, but at least she figured they had the right day, you know, and she was going there for a while uh, until she found this Messianic Jewish congregation. It was just a big deal. It's a big deal now. It was a big, a bigger deal in the day of, uh, of Jesus, certainly. 
And uh, as we look at this, again, Matthew brings us all together the importance of who Jesus is and his identity as the Lord of the Sabbath. Let's take a look at there's uh, five things we want to point out. The first one is that Jesus is accused of unlawful harvesting on the Shabbat or the Sabbath in verses 1 to 8. At that time, Jesus went through the grain fields on the Sabbath. His disciples were hungry and began to pick some heads of grain and eat them. When the Pharisees saw this, they said to him, Look, your disciples are doing what is unlawful on the Sabbath. He answered, Haven't you read what David did when he and his companions were hungry? He entered the house of God, and he and his companions ate the consecrated bread, which was not lawful for them to do, but only for the priest. Or haven't you read in the law that on the Sabbath the priests in the temple desecrate the day and yet are innocent? I tell you that one greater than the temple is here. If you had known what these words mean, I desire mercy, not sacrifice, you would not have condemned the innocent. For the Son of Man is the Lord of the Sabbath. So first we note that uh, under this idea of his, uh, the accusation, uh, the setting of the accusation is the disciples eating grain, which they've picked on the, on the Shabbat or on, on the Sabbath. And there's a, a couple of things that uh, are important to know, and that is that what they were doing, everybody did. It was a normal, normal thing. When you walk from one city to the other, there weren't necessarily roads or paths. You just cut through people's fields, whatever they were growing. And, and of course, some of those got trodden down pretty hard. Jesus mentions that in one of his parables, you know, from people just traveling through. And it was completely legal to just grab whatever was growing. Uh, in this case, uh, it, it's the, the wheat kernels and just grab it and then roll it in your hand and <laughs> blow the chaff away. And what's left then is just the, the corn of it, the kernel that you could pop in your mouth and chew. And it was gummy like and had lots of nutrition to it. And it didn't matter if you're walking along, you could pull something off a tree and eat and keep going. That was not, that was completely, it was in Deuteronomy saying you could do this. In fact, God told the people there, when you're harvesting, don't harvest everything. You know, leave some on the edges. You know, it's for the poor. You got to take care of the people around you and so forth. And there was nothing wrong with, with doing this. Now, to do that today, people may not be real thrilled at you walking through their backyard and grabbing their mangoes off their tree. But hey, if it's hanging over the fence, I figure it's uh, oh, <laughs> open to the public. That's the way I've always viewed that. I, I don't know if that's a, a Christian concept, but I think I can justify it right here with the words of Jesus. I, I've even done that with breadfruit before, just hanging over the edge. Uh, I was just traveling down the road, like Jesus said. And, uh, but that was the way it was in Jesus' day. So these guys are doing nothing uh, illegal. And certainly there's nothing in the law in regards to them picking and rubbing this in their hands, blowing it, and then eating. But, they, but the, again, the Pharisees, because of the, what would become the mission, this oral tradition, according to them, this was breaking the Sabbath law. It wasn't according to God. It wasn't according to Moses. It wasn't according to the Bible. It was according to their uh, oral tra traditions. Uh, again, it's just important to note that Jesus never sinned, you know, uh, and, uh, and neither would he allow his disciples to sin by breaking the law. Could he break the Mosaic law? Well, we'll talk about that in a moment. But uh, again, what he is doing is breaking what they would call, we would call later the, uh, the Mishnah, because they forgot Again, the original intent of what the Sabbath law was uh, was all about. We were at a, a church just a, a few weeks ago, a very formal church. <laughs> Kathy and I were there for a special service, and and um, uh, and I was kind of had it been a while, uh, and uh, in the process. Uh, uh, the fellow that was conducting the, the service up front even, you know, walked around, you know, burning his incense and, you know, the, the whole thing. And, and uh, no, this wasn't another Calvary Chapel. This is a very formal church, what we call the high church, very formal. And, uh, and I was thinking, and, you know, I realized that when he's doing that, uh, that that, that incense is, is to represent the pressure of the people that rise before the throne of God. Uh, but I have to. I had to kind of think of a, of that uh, church full of people. Uh, how many of them are their prayers rising to heaven? You know, like that incense. It's just it's symbolic of what's supposed to be happening. But I just wonder if just the symbol is going on and, and not the intent. You know, it's it's easy. Again, we could look at Judaism and these Pharisees at this point and think we're very far removed from these guys. 
and, and think that, again, this concept of what Jesus was dealing with, which is really religiosity, uh, they get so caught up in, in uh, my moral compass, uh, my rules and regulations, what I've been able to achieve, what I'm willing to do, uh, and it really removes us from what really God's intent was uh, all, all along. I, um, it's one reason, it's just interesting over the years, you know, we've met in a lot of different places, school cafeterias and YMCAs and everything. And some, you know, people walk in to like the YMCA and they've got to cut through all the weightlifting equipment and uh, they can tell by the odors. There's been a few people working out there previously as they make their way into the little room we were in and all that stuff. And, you know, some people are like, okay, cool, man, I like it, you know, because it's so non-churchy. They actually like it. Uh, and there's other people, they, they come in and go, we're out of here. I guess this is not church because they have a really a misconception of church. Church is people. The church is the people. The called out ones is, is what the word actually means that are gathering to, to worship the Lord. It's not a place. It's not what it what it looks like. I actually had a guy and he was a, he was a, he was a pastor here locally and he got the biggest kick out of our hallway coming down here. People walk down that hallway. Looks like you're walking in O triple C. And I have to admit, it does. <laughs> now, actually, the first time I saw it, I thought, well, this is, could be good. This could be bad. It reminds me of some churches I've been in China right off the bat. So it kind of, for me, had this kind of a good, you know, like, eh, I kind of like this, you know. But uh, I'm always concerned about that hallway and whether the lights are on or not. And, you know, if they've cleaned it lately, which they haven't. And I spoke to them about that this week and all these things. But there's some people, it's like they, they can't get beyond that. They can't get by the the fact that if there's not a choir and there's not a robes and there's not certain fixtures that we're really worshiping the Lord. Uh, again, we can move so far beyond in the symbols and the traditions that we forget the intent. And again, so as we look at the Pharisees, uh, let us not uh, judge too quickly. Now, Paul in, uh, uh, in Acts 15, he's, he's having the big church council in Jerusalem talking about... Uh, uh, you know, all these Gentiles that have gotten saved. Peter's there and he's given his testimony. James uh, gets up and uh, he kind of settles the whole deal. And uh, But uh, Peter says a line in there in regards to the law in terms of the Gentiles. He says, let us not put them under the, the yoke that we neither we nor our forefathers could bear. What was that yoke they couldn't bear that was a burden? It was the law. You know, what, what's, what was our subject last week? Jesus said, come unto me. My yoke is easy. My burden is, is light. And I'll give you what? Shabbat. I'll give you rest. So there's, there's definitely a tie-in with what Matthew's been teaching us and telling us about this rest in Jesus and what is going on. Because Jesus, He just really ups the ante. i got to tell you, I mean, all He had to do in answering the Pharisees is say, is, is quote Deuteronomy and quote Leviticus. What they did was perfectly legal, buzz off, uh, or whatever you would a, 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 a dignified rabbi would have said in that day in the vernacular. But he doesn't do that. He he takes the whole subject uh, a lot deeper. Is uh, the second thing we say he defends the actions of his disciples uh, by giving two examples. And the first one that we read was uh, of King David. Uh, in the in the setting there of King David, David's on the run from Saul. Uh, he he goes down at where uh, the, the priests are, are located at that time. He goes up to Ahimelech and and tells him, you know, uh, you know, <laughs> Ahimelech's kind of shaking at his boots, like, why is David, who's like a general in the army, a national hero at this point, he's there without his guys, without his men. He's not armed, nothing, and uh, and why is he there at this time? And there's something going on here. And David says, oh, I'm on a secret mission. <laughs> he lies to him. And uh, he's actually running away from Saul. If you got any, I need some, you know, food and so forth. And, and so the priest says, the only thing we've got is the, uh, the bread from the table of presence, or, or what's called the showbread. And again, as uh, uh, in the tabernacle at that time, later in the temple, as you walked into not the Holy of Holies, but the holy place, as you walked into there... Uh, on the right would be the, the table of showbread, these 12 loaves, one for each of the tribe of Israel. Uh, and then the, the, the menorah uh, on this side and the altar of incense right uh, before them. And once a week, the priests would uh, remove on the Sabbath, they would remove that bread and re replace it. And then only the priests could eat that bread because it had been in that location. It's that bread that the priest says, uh, well, we've got the, 
uh, the bread that we've just removed, so we know it's on the Sabbath day. Uh, and so we've just removed it from the table of presence, and uh, uh, that's all we've got. David says, I'll, I'll take it. And then he goes on and asks for Goliath's sword and so forth, and he, he takes off. You know, the results of that is then, then Saul comes out and finds out about it and kills every one of the priests. And the only guy that survives is, is Abiathar and ends up with David. So it's kind of a radical story, but uh, Jesus taps into that story and this question of the Sabbath. Now, what is this point? To get them back to understand the original intent of what God meant by, by that day and what it meant to have a rest uh, in Him. Again, a rest that we would only find in, in Jesus. He is the Lord of the Sabbath. That's the subject. That's what Matthew's trying to teach us. Uh, but here he goes to King David because, uh, again, King David... Now, it's interesting. You can read a lot of commentaries, and I read a few this week, and it's funny. They hedge all about this, whether David sinned or not. Well, you know, he was going to be the king. He had already been anointed the king, and so he was entitled. They have all these explanations why this was okay. It wasn't okay. He broke the law. What was, what was the penalty for breaking the law? One of the Sabbath laws. What was the penalty? Death. Did they kill David? No. What, what, so Jesus brings, is this a, and this is a well-known story. This is a well-known story uh, to, to Jews. Because hey, you love King David. I mean, you know, if you go to Israel today, you got the King David Hotel. You got the King David this. You got, you don't, and I'm not kidding, I'm not making this up. You don't have McDonald's, you have McDavid's. It's a very big deal. Even to this day, it was a very big deal there. So Jesus uses this illustration uh, to say, now, are you really going to accuse me? Look what David did. Did David sin and break the Sabbath laws? Yes, he did. What was the penalty? Nada. Nothing. So what are you going to do to my guys? Which you know and I know have really not broke God's law, nor his intent, but only your, your moral traditions. Are you going to get down on me as that? So he uses King David uh, as his uh, first illustration. And then secondly... Uh, he goes on and uh, gives the example of the, uh, the priests them, themselves. Uh, the priests work on the Sabbath. Again, they're, they're serving in the temple. They're kindling fire. They're making the sacrifices. They're burning the incense. They're preparing. They're doing all these things. <laughs> Again, interesting, on the Sabbath day, they are making the showbread. The priests had to be bakers too. <laughs> and so they're making the bread uh, and they're, they're taking it in and exchanging that day, but not in the day of Jesus because... The Pharisees and their tradition actually dictated what the priests were doing in the temple. Now, under the law, under God's law, they would bake the bread and they would take it in there on the Shabbat, on the Sabbath. But because of the Pharisees' teaching, their oral traditions, they didn't do it anymore. They, had to, they actually had to have someone else do it or do it the day before. But, but because of the oral teaching, because of the traditions, they were actually breaking the law because they weren't doing what God told them to do, the priest. Now, beyond that, Jesus is saying, they work in the temple uh, every Sabbath. So, uh, is what they are doing wrong? That's his other, his other uh, uh, illustration. But again, he's not simply, he could have very well defended his disciples very quickly, very easily, quoted Leviticus, quoted Deuteronomy, and said, we're out of here. But he's trying to deal with an issue that's much more greater in terms of God's intent for the Sabbath, God's intent for us in terms of having a, a, a rest in Him. So again, Jesus is accused, unlawful harvesting. He defends the actions of His disciples by two uh, illustrations. And then He admonishes the Pharisees by making two statements about Himself. In the first one, Jesus refers to Himself as being greater than the temple. <clears throat> and He refers to Himself, of course, as the Son of Man, which is the term that He liked to use of Himself and that's the term that um, that Daniel used in terms of the Messiah. Jesus seemed to choose that term of himself more than any other. So he says, isn't the Son of Man greater than the temple? Isn't the Messiah greater than the temple? Now, he's not saying I'm the Messiah to them right then, but he's, he's kind of baiting them. Isn't the Messiah more important than the temple? Well, yeah, yeah. He's kind of leading them into that. That's the first statement. Of course, he's going to come around then and say, uh, guess who I am? And he's going to constantly deal with these guys to say, do you believe I'm the Messiah or not? And there's this you know, confrontation going on. We're going to see where it leads at, at the end of this passage. And then he says to the Pharisees, 
uh, that these guys are innocent and you should have known what it means. I desire mercy uh, and not sacrifice. Uh, and there he's quoting Hosea 6.6. 6. Uh, it's more important to God uh, that we show mercy, he says, than, than even uh, keeping the law. Now, there's a, there's a New Testament application of this, and I, uh, I love it when, when there is, because so often we'll see the Apostle Paul take directly from the teaching of Jesus and then teach it to a Gentile audience, and it kind of connects a little bit better for us. And, and Paul does that. It's in a passage we're familiar with, 1 Corinthians 13. There Paul says what love is. Love is patient, love is kind, so on and so forth. And then Paul goes on and says, and says that if you, if you can speak the words of prophecy, if you have the uh, tongues of men and angels but have not love, you're nothing. If you surrender your body to the flames, if you die as a martyr but you have not love, you're nothing. Here's the intent uh, of this whole idea. God is so much more concerned by whether we love Him and love others. Uh, he's more concerned than that than any spiritual gift, than anything we could do, any sacrifice. doesn't matter how religious we are, Paul says. If we don't have love, it's like a, a clonging uh, a symbol. It's just, it's just we're a loud gong, and, that, and that's about it. Uh, it it's, we've missed the, the whole thing. God's very concerned about our hearts. Uh, that's Jesus' point here. I think that's what Paul is saying in 1 Corinthians uh, 13, uh, very, uh, very obviously for us there. Uh, secondly, uh, not only does he kind of bait them by saying that the Messiah is greater than the temple, and they all got to agree with that, then he refers to himself as, as the Lord uh, of the Sabbath. Now in Colossians, Paul says, Let no man judge you in respect to new moons and Sabbath days, which are a shadow of the things to come, but the substance is, is Christ. The Sabbath day was really a, a picture of Jesus, of the Messiah. Uh, Jesus here says He is the, the Lord of the, the Sabbath. If He's the Lord of the Sabbath, then he is, He's God. I mean, He wrote the Sabbath laws. It is the one that wrote the law under the law? Jesus says no. In other words, did Jesus even have to keep the Levitical law? No. He's God. He wrote the thing. Yeah, he doesn't. He's not under it. He is the Lord over it. So this is quite a statement he's making. Because sometimes uh, we miss this. They don't miss it. They understand what he's saying. They're understanding that he is greater than the temple. The Messiah is greater than the temple. Guess who I am? You're worried about me? See, he's, he, he left the disciples and picking grain way behind at this point. He's going at the heart of the issue. Who do you think I really am? And don't you understand what God is concerned about? He's not in turn so concerned about laws and ritual as much as he is this idea of whether you show mercy uh, and whether you're loving towards others. And you guys have so far removed yourself from God's intent. Now you're placing a burden on people. You're actually keeping them from knowing God. You're keeping them from following God because you've moved so far away from the intent. That's what religion does. That's why sometimes we say in the vernacular, Christianity is not a religion, it's a relationship. Uh, it's kind of a sound bite, but, but uh, that's the idea. It's, it's got to be about a, a relationship uh, and certainly not a religion. There's three times that Jesus makes these greater than statements. Uh, he says he's greater than the temple here. Uh, in Matthew 12, he'll say he's greater uh, than the prophet Jonah. And in Matthew 12, 42, he's greater than the king, uh, making reference to uh, King Solomon. And this kind of uh, uh, upsets the, uh, the apple cart for, for these guys more than just a, a little bit. He accuses, he's accused unlawful harvesting, defends their actions, admonishes them. And then he argues for that human compassion is more important than Sabbath traditions. And uh, we go on in our text, verse 9 to 14. Going on from that place, he went into their synagogue, and a man with a shriveled hand was there. Looking for a reason to accuse Jesus, they asked him, Is it lawful to heal on the Shabbat or the Sabbath? He said to them, If any of you has a sheep, and it falls into a pit on the Sabbath, will you not take hold of it and lift it out? How much more valuable is a man than a sheep? Therefore, it is lawful to do good on the Sabbath. Then he said to the man, Stretch out your hand, so he stretched it out, and it was completely restored, just as sound as the other. But the Pharisees went out and plotted how they might kill 
Jesus. So the setting of the confrontation is the synagogue. And again, a couple of things to note from uh, uh, cross references in particular in Luke's gospel. It's not the same day. Again, it's like a, it's either the next Sabbath or the next Sabbath. But again, Matthew, not chronological, groups these things together for uh, a very important uh, uh, point. Again, Jesus is going to the only one that can give us really rest because he's the Lord of the Sabbath. He's above it all. He's very concerned about the intent of our heart more than how religious we are in a sense and which rules we can keep and uh, and we can't keep. And then it moves on to this point of he argues that human compassion, compassion for other people is far more important than religion. It's far more important than rules and regulations, and in this case, uh, Sabbath traditions. Now, uh, they, uh, they, the Pharisees, the same group, look for a reason to accuse him, the, the text says, and they ask him if it's lawful to heal on the Sabbath. Now, two things about this are there that kind of strike me. One is the fact that, <clears throat> again, they're in the, this is the synagogue in Capernaum, and uh, right on the edge of the Sea of Galilee, if you... Uh, ever go to Israel, you'll go to this place and you can stand on the foundation of this synagogue where this took place, which which is is very cool. And uh, uh, it's uh, it's a beautiful setting. Uh, it's a fairly uh, it's only a little bit bigger than our uh, than where, where we meet here. Uh, and so it's uh, so all, all eyes are, are on this <clears throat> when Jesus walks in and they say, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath? They knew two things. They know that Jesus is going to immediately go to the person in that room that had the greatest need. In that case, a man with a shriveled hand. The, the enemies of Jesus knew that he was so compassionate that beyond anything else and anything else on his mind, whatever else might be going on that day, he would immediately be drawn to the person in that room that had the greatest need. That, that needed to be shown the most compassion, that uh, needed somebody to care for them. The enemies of Jesus knew that. <clears throat> the other thing they knew is he had the power to heal. See, there's no denial that Jesus did these miracles by his enemies. Did Jesus really heal? His worst critics said that he healed, and they believed he could heal even before he did it. And so they confront him and say, is it lawful to heal uh, on, the, on the Shabbat or on the Sabbath? <clears throat> and what Jesus does... He, uh, he states that it's lawful to do good on the Sabbath. And then he illustrates it with a very important illustration. Simple, but again, according to the law, if you had an animal, he picks a sheep in this case, and it, uh, it's hurt or injury, it's, its life is at risk, you could do work you know, on, on the Sabbath. You could go get it and get it out of the ditch or out of the predicament or whatever it might be, keep it from falling over the cliff, whatever it might be, uh, be going on. And they would have to all agree with that. So then he says, isn't man more important than animals? Now, there's a few environmentalists that would argue with Jesus over, over that, but at least we know where Jesus stands in the whole thing is that we, we are actually are more important uh, than, the, than the animals out there. Uh, but besides that, he's dealing with an issue that also is a very contemporary issue in our day. He says, the sanctity of life is more important than rules and regulations and anything else. And again, every Jewish person in that day and, and many today would, would certainly understand that concept and, and get it. Let me give you a couple of Old Testament examples. Uh, <clears throat> prior to Moses being born, Pharaoh had given a decree that said, because he's realizing that the Jews are becoming uh, too numerous. There's a Pharaoh that don't, no longer remembers Joseph and so forth. So he's told the Jewish midwives, when a male child is about to be born, tell me, tell my officials, because once he's born, we will come and kill him, and throw him in the Nile. Well, you remember what the Jewish midwives did. <laughs> they just helped birth all these baby boys, including a guy named Moses. And then when, when, it, when confronted by Pharaoh's officials, they said, oh, well, uh, you know, these Jewish women, they're hardy. You know, they just kind of give birth real quick. And uh, hey, we can't quite get there in time. Lie. They lied. Was it the right thing to do? Absolutely. Because the sanctity of life was far more important than obeying what Pharaoh had said to them. Second example, Rahab, who hides the spies. Spies going to... Jericho, check it all out, of course, and uh, and they end up being hidden by Rahab. You remember the story? Uh, she ends up getting saved and her family as a result, but she's aware of, of what God's done, 
bringing them out of Egypt. She's aware of the miracles and so forth. Everybody's talking about it in town. And she places her faith in, in Jehovah God. By the way, she's a prostitute at the time. And um, so she hides the spies. And when the guards come to look, she says, oh, no, they're not here. In fact, I saw them heading down this way and the guards take off. She saves their life. She lied. Was that against the Levitical law? Was that against the Ten Commandments? Absolutely. Was it the right thing to do? Absolutely. Because the sanctity of life trumps everything else in terms of Judaism. Jesus knows that. And he's bringing this issue before these guys because they care more about the oral traditions and the religiosity removed from the intent of God's Word, which was all about, again, a day of rest. That's all it was. A national identity that was between God and them under the covenant with Moses and this remembrance of being freed, freed from slaves uh, in Egypt. And it was all about how God cares more about mercy and compassion, as Jesus quotes Hosea, uh, and it's more that he cares about the sanctity of, of human life uh, here. Let me ask you this. Someone breaks into your house, guys, and they've got an Uzi or some other automated weapon, and your, your wife and your children are, are hiding in the back of the house, and they say, is there anybody else in this house? What do you say? Ah, wife, kids right down the hall. Just go right on down and kill them. I don't think you say that, do you? I think you say, no, it's it. I'm it. I think that's what you say. Why? Because the sanctity of life is more important. That, that's the point here. And certainly that's a concept that we've really lost in our culture uh, uh, as we see in terms of the in increase of, uh, of abortion and the things that go around of what we refer to as a, a culture of death. And certainly we'd be a lot better off if, if we still held that kind of a view uh, of the sanctity of, uh, of life. And let me uh, read a cross-reference in Mark of this same uh, setting that maybe helps uh, paint the picture a little bit more and adds uh, an important little phrase. In Mark 3, 5, uh, Jesus says, He looked at them in anger and deeply distressed at their stubborn hearts, uh, said to the man, Stretch out your hand. He stretched it out, and his hand was completely restored. Then the Pharisees went out and began to plot with the Herodians how they might kill Jesus. Now, two things is that you see the anger of Jesus of what's going on. He's not just saying, oh, you guys, too bad you don't really get it here. Go, you know, stretch out your hand and be healed. No, he's, he looks at them with anger and deep distress because of how stubborn and hard their hearts were. These are the people that were supposed to be leading the other people to God in a relationship with him. And, and they weren't. And that really ticked Jesus off. Because they, they had gotten so far removed to what the whole thing was supposed to be about. Now notice also, they not only plot to kill him, but they plot with the Herodians. Who are the Herodians? Well, like in Herod. They were the ones that were sold out to the Romans. They were the traitors of the country. They were the most despised uh, sect within Judaism. And the Pharisees, the righteous people, <laughs> are now getting together with them to plot the, the death of Jesus. You talk about hypocritical. I mean, these are guys they would normally hate, but they hated Jesus more. Why? Well, he kept feeding people and healing them and being compassionate to them. Just really ticked them off. <laughs> and he kept proving he was the Messiah and kept saying things that would indicate he was absolutely the Messiah. And they had options, like we have options. It's either bow your knee, realize he's the Savior, or you got to figure out something to do with him. You got to have, oh, he was a good teacher. Oh, he was a great prophet. I believe that. Uh, oh, I respect many things that he said. I'm sorry, that just doesn't wash. Jesus said, you're either before me, you're against me. <laughs> and the same thing, uh, again, we can have a stubborn heart or we can uh, uh, bow our knee. Previously, they had accused him of blasphemy when he healed the paralytic. Uh, they uh, weren't real thrilled about him eating at uh, Matthew, the tax collector's house. But this whole assault on the Sabbath day and their traditions, as far as they were concerned, were even worse. Now, the fifth thing is that Jesus appeals to the prophecy, uh, to prophecy that proclaim his Messiahship. We see this in verses 15 to 21. Of their, aware of this, Jesus withdrew from that place. Many followed him and he healed all their sick, warned them not to tell who he was. This was to fill, fulfill what the, was spoken through the prophet Isaiah. 
Here is my servant whom I have chosen, the one I love and whom I delight. I will put my spirit on him and he will proclaim justice to the nations. He will not quarrel or cry out. No one will hear his voice in the streets. A bruised reed he will not break in a smoldering wick he will not snuff out till he leads justice to victory in his name. The nations will put their hope. Uh, just a couple of things before I even get into my notes. Every time it uses the word nations, which it does twice there, that means Gentiles. So very early on, Matthew is, is uh, leaving this, these trails to indicate, yes, if you're reading this for the first time in the first century, you're finding out very early on that they are going to reject him as the Messiah. They did reject him, and the gospel is going to go to the Gentiles. And it was, and it was all based in Scripture. And uh, so every time you see that word, just kind of note that. But here, uh, Jesus was determined to follow God's timetable uh, in giving prophecy. So he withdraws. How does he deal with their confrontation? He just says it as it is, and then he just pulls back uh, and he withdraws because he was concerned about God's timetable. He heals these people. He continues to have compassion on them. And he says, and don't go tell anyone. Don't make a big deal out of this. Is he trying to use reverse psychology so that they'll talk more about him? No, he means it. Don't make a big deal out of this. Because, uh, as we'll see later, eventually the crowds would try to make him king by force. I mean, they want a Messiah. They want somebody to throw out the Romans. They want a military victor. They want a political leader. They want their land back. They want some kind of freedom, and they want it now. And he's the guy. And they try to make him king by force. He refuses. Again, he would come not to wear a golden crown, but a crown of thorns in his first coming to, uh, uh, to Israel and to declare himself the Messiah. So he would pull back uh, because he would not really come into Jerusalem until the day that Daniel said. Again, we won't go into all that, but da Daniel prophesied the exact day that Jesus, that the Messiah would come in, and Jesus came in exactly uh, on that day. Secondly, Jesus reacts to the plot by fulfilling the words of the prophet Isaiah. And this is Isaiah 42. And uh, some words that we're familiar with. He will not quarrel or cry out, which he didn't. No one will hear his voice in the streets. A bruised reed he will not break. In a smoldering wick, he will not snuff out till he leads justice to victory. In his name, the nations or the Gentiles will put their hope. Now, certainly, <clears throat> there's two things about, about this uh, prophecy and to try to tie this up real shortly. A bruised reed and a smoldering wick were considered useless. That's the point. Uh, you know, a reed, you know, it's a hollow stem. You could use it for a lot of different, uh, different things. Uh, in that day, but if it's if it's kind of bent, useless. The smoldering wick, uh, it's at the end. The flame's not going in the oil lamp, and it's just kind of smoking. But there's not a, there's not a, a, enough of it left to do anything with. You just let it go out. It was useless. And Jesus takes what is meant to be a prophecy of the Messiah and says, "This applies to me. I am the Messiah. I'm the Lord of the Sabbath. Anybody that would come to me, and I will give them rest. It's a promise." And oh, by the way, anybody that considers themselves useless for anything to anyone, that's who I'm looking for. That's who I'm looking for. And, and it says, hey, a bruised reed, he would never break. A smoldering wick, he would never snuff out. Uh, again, he didn't come to uh, confront. He came really to uh, comfort and to, to lead us to uh, to himself, uh, that which would be considered useless to anybody else, Jesus says. Again, Jesus is in the business of restoration, but again, he he doesn't take a. a, a, a I love this uh, Ravi Zacharias quote. He says he did not come to take bad men and make them good. He came to take dead men and make them alive. And there's a real difference in that. He didn't come to take us better moral people and have a very good little religion going on here. He came to pe take people that were, that were useless in maybe their own eyes and other people's eyes, dead in their sins and their trespasses, and give them a new life in Christ. All things have passed away. All things have become new. I'm way over time when we're supposed to have communion this morning. So, <clears throat> you guys stay there. Don, once you bring the communion elements 
up because we want to we want to take communion. And uh, I'm going to pray as they come up and get ready to uh, to do this. And uh, we'll hang in here just a, a few more minutes. You know that uh, that old um, chorus. Let's see if I can <laughs> figure out how it goes. I I will serve you because I love you. You have given life to me. I was nothing until you found me. You have given life to me. Heartaches, broken people, ruined lives are what you died on Calvary. Your touch is what I long for. You have given life to me. Didn't sing it well, but uh, <clears throat> that's a good theme song. The reason that we serve Him is because we love Him. Heartaches, broken people, ruined lives are why you died on Calvary. That, that's, I think, what this passage is, is all about. He is the Lord of the Sabbath. He's above it all because He's, he's God come, come in the flesh. <laughs> Could He break the Levitical law if He wanted to? Did He? No. And nor did he allow his guys to do. But he's very concerned about tradition and religion that we can build up that actually prevent us and other people from the original intent of the Sabbath rest, which is to have a, a rest in him, a relationship with him. He's the fulfillment. And as we take uh, communion this morning, it's a reminder of what uh, the price was, uh, that we might have that relationship with him. Again, the bread representing his body that was... We say bruised. It was brutalized. Uh, again, for, for us, uh, it certainly was broken. Uh, Isaiah says for our healing, and uh, Isaiah is very clear, it's our spiritual healing. And then the cup representing his blood. Uh, again, Leviticus says the life is in, in the blood. Jesus gave up his life. That's what was required. Again, under the law, uh, there was no forgiveness of sins without the shedding of blood. So these things that remind us of the price that was paid. And of course, the way in which Jesus did this at that uh, uh, Passover Seder, then he couples that concept with the concept of the, uh, the, uh, the bride and the groom when he says, I will not break, drink this cup again until I drink it with you anew in my Father's kingdom. I, we're, we're now engaged. <laughs> we're, we're married. The, ch the church is the bride of Christ. Jesus has gone away. And he says, but I will come back. Again, the tie-in there is John 14, 2. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go away to prepare a place for you. And if I go away, I will come back and take you to be with me that you also may be where I am. I'm the groom. I'm going away. I'm preparing but the, the day of the wedding feast is coming and I will come back for you in that day, what we refer to as the, the rapture, the rapture of the church to be with the Lord. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for these elements that uh, are only a picture, they're only a shadow, they're only a type, uh, but they have tremendous meaning to us because of what they do represent. Lord, we thank you that you did not come to somehow make, make us bad into good, but you came to give us uh, a, a new life a life of uh, abundance and a life with uh, meaning and purpose, a life that can be lived with a clear conscience, Lord, and a, uh, and a full heart, knowing that all of our sins have been pardoned, we've been redeemed, we've been forgiven. Let's take the bread representing the, the body of Christ. And let's take the cup representing the blood of Christ. Lord, it's not our intent to certainly rush through anything. We pray that um, these elements again would speak to our, our own hearts. You said, do this in remembrance of you. So we remember what it is that you've done for us. We remember that that you rose again, that you're coming again for us one day, the day that we'll be 
Uh, again, whether before the rapture or at the rapture, either way, Lord, as the Apostle Paul says, to be absent from the body is to be present with Christ. Lord, so I pray that we would be more loving and more merciful people uh, as you've called us to be. The, the things that we do that might even appear to be out of tradition, might appear to be religious, or would, would, would continue to be in response to your love for us. Uh, I will serve you because I love you. You've given your life for me. I pray that that would be our, our heart's cry this morning. And we pray your, your blessing on us as, as we go. And in Jesus' name, God bless you. can I do for you? You have given me eyes to see. What can I do for you? You pulled me out of bondage and you made me renewed inside. Filled up a hunger that had always been denied. Opened up a door no man can shut And you opened it up so wide And you chose me to be among the few What can I do for you? You have given your life for me What can I do? You have explained every mystery. What can I do for you? As soon as a man is born, you know the sparks begin to fly. He gets wise in his own eyes, and he's made to believe a lie. Who would deliver him from the death he is born to die? Well, he'll give it all, and there's no morning one can't pretend. 